which is the Emergency Board Broadband Action Plan. So we are back and um, I had a discussion, email, phone message with Chair Briglin last week. His committee has already started working on a committee bill for some of those pole attachment licensure issues that were in the plan. Um, he wanted, didn't, he thought we were working on one and I said, no, we weren't. So if he wanted to take the lead and send it to us, um, they have pretty much one area of jurisdiction and we're starting to get hit with our many areas of jurisdiction. Um, so, um, we, uh, that's just an update on some of the testimony we took on Tuesday. At that time, the um, independent providers had asked for a chance to, to talk with us. We didn't have time on Tuesday, so they're here today. Um, and we've got Roger Nishi from Waitsfield Champlain Valley Cave Telephone. And we're going to move through the list. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. We also have coming up this afternoon an amendment to 301, which is uh, the 248A, the notification to E911 bill. We do have an amendment. And perhaps, Senator Brock, you can explain the amendment, so if it impacts any of these gentlemen, they would have the opportunity to testify if they had concerns. Sure, I uh, had, we had asked, I think, uh, Senator Hooker, uh, and I'm not sure if she's on at this point, since she was the introducer of the amendment, that she could explain what it is that they're trying uh, to accomplish with the amendment. And I'm and not sure. we, we wrote her in, but I don't, I think she is coming in for the discussion at 415. Okay. Well, in any case, what their amendment does, uh, it, it relates to the section of the bill uh, that deals with power failures uh, of uh, network equipment. And what we were trying to do in the bill that we passed last year is to make sure that we were aware or we had a process in place so that the E911 board in particular was aware where there were power failures that were substantive that caused a lack of connectivity to E911 that somebody was tracking it, uh, not with tremendous precision, but to give us an idea of how big a problem we had. And that was the sole purpose of it, to get a, a sense of how big the problem was so that in going forward, we could try to figure out solutions that made sense. Uh, that's what the underlying bill was designed to do. And what we was that our notification, the notification would come to us if there were 25 or more customers impacted for half an hour or more. And so a set of reporting requirements were established and uh, an attempt by rule by the U911 board to do it. As we looked at the legislation, though, it was brought to our attention that uh, we were perhaps inadvertently including some folks in it uh, based on how we dealt with back uh, with with uh, system backup, uh, and the notion there was that the technically and literally the way we it reads what we did before is that if there was a problem with a backup system, even in a customer's home where they were responsible for the battery, we wanted reporting for that, and that was not uh, what our intent was to go to that level. And so this uh, the the changes that we made in 301 were designed to do that. Uh, Senator Hooker uh, has some constituents in Shrewsbury, and if the committee remembers last year, uh, we had a lot of testimony from folks in Shrewsbury who found themselves uh, without telephone coverage for somewhere in the vicinity of two weeks, uh, and they had some backup uh, systems uh, connected to their own homes that were inside the homes that they were, in fact, unaware of and were unaware of how to get a battery to fix them. Uh, what our uh, what Senator Hooker's amendment does uh, to the language that we had relative to this in 201, uh, and this is this is from Maria Royal's comments. It's designed to make a provider responsible for a power failure 
or the failure of a backup battery at a consumer's home. Uh, there is an expectation that the provider will notice and report if the backup battery inside the consumer's home fails, or indeed if the network interface on the exterior of the home fails. Uh, now, uh, uh, Maria goes on to say that what she understands both from uh, Dr. Guite at, at, uh, uh, has said is that as well as from other carriers that this is not possible. For example, a homeowner might remove the battery, disconnect the power, shut off the circuit breaker, et cetera. Uh, and uh, she doesn't believe that this would be visible. Now, uh, in the past day, uh, I've spoken to uh, uh, Michel Guite. I've spoken to his uh, director of engineering. I've spoken to a number of people, including some other carriers. And what he's talking about, the uh, Shrewsbury customer, is the network interface that sits on the outside of the house. Mm -hmm. That is the... Uh, piece of technology, as I understand it, that takes the signal from the fiber and converts it uh, to something that can be uh, uh, that can be dealt with electrically within, within the house, and that there also is typically a battery backup that is inside the house, the battery under the control of, of the homeowner. Uh, what uh, I had a, about an hour discussion with the consumer in, 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 in Shrewsbury this morning, and the essence of it is he wants to know that if there is a failure of that network interface device uh, for there to be notice provided to the E911 board as in our underlying law. Uh, in talking with uh, the, uh, the provider VTEL, and this seems to be confirmed by other providers that I've spoken with, is that there is visibility to the provider if the network interface is not operating However, there is no mechanism in which they regularly and continuously monitor it to aggregate the kind of statistics that we're looking for, although VTEL indicates that it's working on trying to create that. So that's kind of a long-winded explanation of what uh, they're trying to do. Uh, in, in point of fact, as I read the amendment, though, uh, it, it seems to me that we largely have covered that in our underlying bill, because what this says is if there is a uh, uh, something that goes for 25 customers or more where there's an outage in which E91 con connectivity is not there and it belongs uh, exclusively, it, it is on equipment owned by the provider that is exclusively controlled, that's important, exclusively controlled by the provider, they have an obligation to report. Uh, if it's not exclusively controlled, uh, then they do not. And that was our intent, as I understand. Okay, but Randy, 301 excluded the national cable, right? The national providers? It did not exclude the national, well, it, there was another section, I think it's section three, yeah. that said that we would allow uh, those companies that report to the FCC mm -hmm. to report right. what they report to the FCC, which is not as granular as what we right. in Vermont are requiring. And we did that because we found that the the providers, the Comcast uh, of, of the world, did not have a system that was set up to do that, that it would be uh, costly to create such a system. And we knew that California is in the process of coming up with a more granular standard. And uh, our uh, goal in doing this particular amendment is to say, rather than create something that is the, the only one in the country that does this, that's unique to Vermont and that's costly, and that likely will result in some costs possibly being passed on to Vermont consumers. We should wait for California to do what it does so that we don't create uh, in effect a one-off uh, because if for no other reason, our goal in getting this information is not to use it as a basis for specific action, but to try to give us an idea of how big a problem we have, not to, to come up with granular solutions. And it certainly was not to look on a consumer by consumer basis individually to indicate when their system was down so as to be able to report something. That was not our intent. Right, so I think if the reason I wanted to just flag this today is because the amendment was brought to us yesterday um, and we put it on for discussion. The bill is on the floor, It'll probably come up tomorrow. Um, it probably will only, you know, if it's going to impact anyone because the big national providers like Comcast and Consolidated are kind of, well, I'm not sure about Consolidated, 
the F and whoever's under FCC reporting rules is off the hook. I'm not sure about the independents like um, the Waitsfield Champlain Valley. So I just wanted a heads up on this. I've told the proposer of the amendment, it might be more complicated than we have time to deal with given our rather strange floor system right now. Um, and this bill does still have to go to the house. So if they wanna, you know, th there's another option, but I wanted to let everyone know um, so no one can say, but I was there and no one said anything to me. Um, this has just come up and we don't have our usual mechanisms for letting everyone know. And I don't think most of you have your usual lobbyists in the building uh, checking in with us on hourly schedule. So um, I just wanted to make sure people knew that there were proposals out there. One so thing that's with, clear though is that the bill uh, that's on the floor right now uh, re eliminates some of the requirement to for providers to be responsible for backup. It's designed to clarify that to eliminate the responsibility that carriers have for doing something that they can't do, such like as monitoring change, backup yeah. in people's houses. Yeah, you can't change the battery in my kitchen. So, um, we will start with Mr. Nishi. Haven't seen you in a while. So welcome. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank, you. thank you for having me here today. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. For the record, I'm Roger Nishi and I'm with Waitsfield and Champlain Valley Telecom. And today I'm here on behalf of Waitsfield and Champlain Valley Telecom, as well as the independent local exchange carriers of Vermont. They include Franklin Telephone Company, OTT, Shoreham Telephone, Topsham Telephone Company, TD Telecom, which includes Northfield, Leadville, and Perkinsville, and also VTEL. We all would like to express our gratitude in the, to the DPS in coming up with this, this plan so, so quickly. Um, it provides a roadmap to, to get broadband to many people much quicker. And if funded properly, it, it could get brought the 100 over 100 to everyone in the state. It, it always come, as we always say at our company, it takes time and money. And if there, if there would have been the money, pots of money five years ago, we'd be five, five years ahead of where we are now. So that being said, let, let me give a little bit of background about the companies. We, we've been around a long time, most of us for well over 100 years providing voice and, and more recently data, and some of us do have cable TV. Um, we're actually regulated as eligible telecommunications carriers and the state looks at our, our services, our quality of service and, and our voice quality and, and re still regulate us in terms of, of access to 911. We're also carriers of last resort. And what, what I mean by that is we build to everyone in the areas we serve. We don't drop into an area and pick off the high volume, high revenue businesses. We serve and we don't, we don't just pick off highly populated areas. We serve the areas in, within the, the territories that, that we, we, we live and work. And we build to the towns, but we also build out to the middle of nowhere where um, there would be people would, that would say that it probably isn't even economically feasible to build there, but we build there because uh, it, it's what we do and we're carriers last resort. So that all being said, uh, we started when there was no service in the areas 100 years ago. So in some ways you could say, hey, you're sort of like the CUDs, um, but, but 100 years ago. And uh, uh, mm -hmm. so, with that, let me, let me talk a little bit about um, the emergency broadband action plan, why I'm actually here today. Um, we, were, we were really only briefly mentioned in the plan. And I, I, as we read it, we said, hey, what about us? We were some of the first companies to really bring 100% broadband to the state. 
uh, albeit it was really slow, but everyone had broadband. And over time, we upgraded our networks. We continued to upgrade our networks. We, we installed the, the much maligned DSL, what everyone says we can't have anymore. But let me say that by investing into DSL over the past 10 years, we got our bang for the buck. All customers had broadband. And if we wouldn't have done that, we had had many customers with very, very slow speeds and several, if, if it would have been fiber that was, we were investing on, people that were very fortunate to have fiber and people very unfortunate to have almost no speed whatsoever. So it was the right decision at the time, but we continue to evolve. And in that evolve, it meant it, it's, it's fiber. Um, but let, let me talk a little bit about, um, um, about why I'm here. We want to be part of the solution. We are part of the solution. Uh, by working with us, um, it's really the most, it's the quickest and most efficient way to get broadband infrastructure um, out there immediately without duplicating infrastructure. We, we won't be doing overbuilds. We'll be building on our, our networks. And many of us are ready to start right now. We, 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 we can move our projects around um, to, to get the broadband to those that don't have it. Um, we have the experience and the track record uh, in building and maintaining networks. And uh, as I've said, we continue to upgrade our networks over time to continue to improve. Many people say, well, what are the ILEX doing about fiber? We, we invest fiber each and every year, whether it's mainline or to our end users. Uh, each and every one of our remotes, uh, the 80 or so that we have in our company, they are, they are all fiber fed. So there is fiber in the network. Now it's just continuing to push the fiber deeper into our networks and, and also uh, hooking up the customers. A few other things. By working with the ILEX, 100% um, of the money that we receive is going to be going into the building of the networks. It's not going to go into planning. It's not going to go into administrating. It's not going to go into writing business plan. It is going into the network. So it's money well spent. Um, and in doing so, we'll, get, we'll continue to get our customers the joint use network, the network that provides voice and also provides the data that everyone wants and, and needs in, in this current time. Uh, what, what's the answer? Of course, we, we want, it, it's fiber. It, uh, it's the answer to meeting customers' needs now and in the future. And uh, uh, even though it costs more than copper, it, it's a great investment for the long term. We do not want to have to go back five years from now and be in, and, and taking out some technology and putting in fiber. Let's get it in now. Let's spend the money once. Um, let's, let's just stop all the incremental steps. Let's get to the answer we want. And, and that's what the state has said when, when they came up with the goal of 100 over 100. Um, okay. finally, to, to, what, one other thing on this is building broadband. It takes time. If you say, go today, you have $50 million weights field to spend in your area. It'll, it'll take us five years to spend that and get the, the services out to the, to the customers. So, or probably even more. So it's something to where it's really imperative that we start as soon as possible um, and, and, and get it going because we need to secure our contractors for those that haven't, we have, and we need to make sure our supply chain is working and we're, and we're getting all, all of the equipment and, and materials that we need to do build networks. So as I said, building broadband takes time, but we're ready to go now. So that's, that's really why I'm here today. That I, I'm asking, free up some money, get us some money, and uh, we'll, we'll get to job. We'll get started on the jobs. We'll, we've talked about taking jobs that we have slated for next year and trying to pull them into this year to get the jobs done and to get more people broadband. Okay. Is it going to be difficult? Yes, it will be, but we're committed to it. I'm talking a lot, so should I? I should I? No, that's that's that? fine. I think we've got two stages. One is the department's long-range plan to do a reverse auction on every county in the state, um, and that is dependent on further federal funding. There is no funding for that plan now. 
there's some possibility we could find some present COVID money to go forward. Um, but that money, and it's been reconfirmed as recently as two days ago, has to be spent and the project done, but at least spent. Um, I don't know who's gonna go up the mountain and see if that last 50 feet of line is in, but uh, it has to be pretty much done by next January. So if you've got some shovel ready projects, um, that would be helpful to know. It, and then there's the big if some of us are pretty sure we have spent the 1.2 billion more than once. Um, there's a lot of need out there, but maybe we could get, you know, a couple million bucks to do something with broadband. Um, also, I, th I think we'll be looking at areas where schools have been particularly negatively impacted on their um, ability to do um, remote learning um, because some of us think there's a probably better than even chance that we'll be doing remote learning again um, for at least a number of weeks. Um, we may all be proven wrong, but um, no one quite knows what the course of this virus is gonna be. So if you can do that, that would be helpful. Senator McDonald. Is the witness uh, saying that if Waitsfield Cable was received funds, that all the money that was received would go towards a, a minimum of 100 to 100 broadband and would not be used for any other purposes? Yes. So in, in terms of this, if, if we get the funding as it's written up in this, it would go straight to the jobs and it would go to fiber jobs and getting fiber out to our end user customers. Um, Madam Chair, and I, again, I don't know if the witness can answer this, but we've been, it's been suggested that there be a reverse auction to find out where money goes. Um, how could we understand how a reverse auction works? Um, my understanding is that you can bid basically zero um, and how reverse, it is not traditional. How does a reverse auction work and how could you possibly bid to do 100, 100 and be included as a winner in such an auction? So in, in, in terms of reverse auction, I, th I think the floor or the starting price in this was the $4,240. And obviously the, it works as, if a company says, I think I can do that for $3,000 per location. And then the bidding goes on and on. And obviously when you start getting to the lower levels, the companies that are doing the bidding and that want to really win the project, they will have to supply a lot of their own capital. So that's, that's generally how they go. So there, there is input and, and financial uh, backing of the companies either through their current capital or, or through additional loans. Now there is a second part of this, and, and that's one thing I haven't brought up is the ILEX have an options of an emergency broadband action plan, high cost area program. So to use the, our current universal service funding program to fund uh, our networks in the, in the rural ILEC areas. And that would be a situation in which we would have to commit to bu uh, building everyone to 25, uh, greater than 25, over three or, or 100 over 100 and fiber to everyone that doesn't have the 25 over three today. And, and that's something that if the money were available now, once again, we wouldn't have to wait three months for the auction to start in that instance. So that is, is an option that is in the, in the plan and I, we're, we're all for it. We're all for giving the, the IDAC the options of doing the, the option or, the, or getting the high cost area program. Funny. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. So the final question I would be, um, what if you are like uh, the witness who is would take every penny and put it into 100, 100, and someone else goes into the same auction and says, well, I'll, we'll do it for much less money, but it'll be 25, three. How do we arrange an auction that has people bid against for the 100, 100 and not allow 
allow others to get the money because they promised to do cheap stuff. Right. Right now, I believe the standard for the auction as it's been pre presented to us is to bring everybody who has less than 25.3 up to at least 25.3. That would be, I assume, a negotiation between us and the um, department. It also would probably limit the number of homes we may be able to service. It, it costs more per home. Well, uh, it puts Waitsfield Cable out of the competition if they're so well, uh, it, it, in, and again, yeah, uh, my question is, it looked like it was divided up by county, and I don't think any of these small companies could bid on an entire county. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it may be dividing it up into different service areas. We've so got a long way to go. Right now, we don't have any money. So it's a good time to talk. Sandra Pearson. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask Roger a clarifying question. And we're all still getting up to speed with the plan as it's been presented. But you seem to suggest that, that uh, telecoms like yours were somehow excluded. Um, and could you just say more about that so that I, I, I fully understand it, please? So in, in, in some of the suggestions there was talking, there, there wasn't really a specific mention of, of ILEX or, or the smaller ILEX. And, and while we may have been interweaved throughout, there was, there was just really not anything that said, oh, this is what the ILEX are doing. And, and so that, that's really how it's coming about it. And, and, and that, and it, it, we realize that we can do a lot and we want to be part of it. So, um, I think it was, it was just the way it was written. It wasn't a, a, a slide, it was an overall plan. And, and I'm saying that we want to be heard. That's fair. Okay, other questions. Senator Ballant, I don't have you on my screen. Now I've got something I'm here. else on my screen. So if you want to, you're going to have to holler if you want to ask a question. Okay. Somehow. You seem to be the one that's moved to the further screen. Okay, I'm going to move on to Tim Wilkerson, which is New England Cable and Telecommunications. And good afternoon, Madam Chair. Can you hear me? Good afternoon. Yep. Excellent. Loud and clear. Thank you. So, once again, good morning to you. Uh, good afternoon to you, esteemed members of the committee. My name is Tim Wilkerson. I am president of the New England Cable and Telecommunications Association, or NECTA. We're a regional association representing private broadband and cable companies in five New England states. In Vermont, we represent Charter Communications, Comcast, and Waitsfield, Tele um, Waitsfield and Champlain Valley Telecom. Thank you for the opportunity to testify on, on potential broadband expansion in Vermont. I've spoken to several of you in the past about our members' commitment to the state and ways we can again partner with Vermont policymakers to expand broadband products and services to your residents. Our commitment to Vermont is longstanding and growing. Today, our companies provide high-speed broadband to 155,000 homes and businesses in Vermont to approximately 9,000 miles of fiber. These previous investments in state-of-the-art networks have prepared our, our members to absorb the increased and longer periods of peak internet, internet demand during the pandemic. The reality of our networks in Vermont can be viewed in, real, in nearly real time with the recent launch of a state-by-state -state dashboard by NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. I provided you a link to that dashboard in footnote, footnote one of my testimony. That dashboard reveals that in Vermont, our customers' downstream usage has increased by 19% and upstream usage has increased by 40% since March 1st. Despite these surges in demand, our customers have not experienced speed reductions or connectivity outages. And there's a clear reason why these networks are so reliable. Our members forecast their investments 18 to 24 months in advance to anticipate and exceed 
future customer use of broadband. These are world-class, fiber-rich, high-speed broadband networks. What speeds, Madam Chair? I don't understand what world-class fiber okay. means. These, these are terms, okay. not Mr. numbers. Wilkin, Wilkinson, can you tell us what speeds you're talking about? Absolutely. Um, the height and the top speeds that we provide residential customers throughout Vermont are the same that they would get in Boston, DC, or wherever our, our companies okay. serve, are one gig residential service. That, that in terms of the of, of us who are still barefoot, um, what does that mean in terms of up and down? So up load speeds, it's one gigabit. So well beyond the 100 by 100, which um, has been a point of, of discussion in many past, um, past um, hearings, depending on what type of product runs to your house or to your business, the floor is at least 35 up speed up to a gigabit speed. Okay. For, up, for upload speeds. So does that meet the 100, 100 standard? Oftentimes it surpasses it. Does it meet it? On no. Every, our customers have, t our companies have tiered pricing for their, for their customers. They can exceed that price. They can fall below that price. It depends on their of, of the affordability in which of the okay. product that they would like to. Purchase. I think what, because Senator McDonald is asking. I understand I, you know, I can get more or less TV channels depending on how much I want to pay. But the ability to feed me all 22,000 of them is there. How is, is it is the product there? that if I decided I got four people at home working on a computer and it's not holding, I could up my level of service and the speed, your system would have the speed to deliver it? Absolutely, yes. And I would say from a baseline before that, our, the architecture of our companies prepare for 18 devices in the home. 18, which exceeds, which most people are using at one time. So as I said before about the investments our companies make are 18 to 24 months in advance purposefully for this very reason. They've been in this business for a long time and they've seen the way that usage patterns have, have taken place and they are anticipating and exceeding what they think each home and business will need. So you absolutely, you're Typical levels of service will more than exceed everything that you need as a user. If yeah. for some reason that you numbers. have- Numbers, numbers. He, he was a teacher, he needs numbers. So yeah, so as I understand. Um, <laughs> the person, and I mean that, and I mean that respectfully, um, I, I would let the next witness, um, John Suttich from Comcast, speak to ex okay. precisely those tiers. Fair enough, thank you. But I okay. think my testimony is going to provide a pretty robust and comprehensive approach to speed, 100 by 100, and capability. The last time I got a speeding ticket, I, it, it was not for driving robustly. It was for exceeding a certain speed. Thank Correct. You. Networks are about robustness that it allows speed. Absolutely, Senator. OK. All right. All right. Um, May any and I, that's the end of your testimony. No, I have. Okay, the okay. floor is still yours. Thank you so much. So, given these facts about our our networks, our members are well suited to once again partner with the state of Vermont. This time, when when federal um, stimulus money becomes available for broadband exp expansion, specifically, it appears that that in within DPS's plan both the connectivity initiative and the land extension programs are the best place for our uh, for partnerships with our members. But before speaking about future partnerships, I'd like to highlight past and ongoing public private partnerships that have resulted in, um, in expanded broadband. Starting under Governor Shumlin, Vermont awarded connectivity initiative grants as you're aware of, reaching hundreds of unserved residences in multiple municipalities. And our me members participated in a number of those successful partnerships. 
the Connectivity Initiative successes served as a model for neighboring Massachusetts and New Hampshire who have entered into similar public-private partnerships with a range of providers bringing broadband to unserved areas. The Massachusetts experience is quite instructive. For the past five years, of the 53 communities completely unserved or only partially served by a provider, high-speed broadband has been greatly expanded through an open, competitive, technology-neutral bidding process. Today, only one of those 53 communities do not have a provider. 17, 17 communities have built out to approximately 96% of their premises and construction continues in the remaining 35 communities. Of the 52 municipalities, Massachusetts municipalities I just mentioned, nearly half are served by a NECTA member, offering up to one gigabit residential service like their Vermont customers. As this committee, your counterparts in the house and the administration officials determine the details of what programs utilize federal stimulus money, I strongly urge you to focus your energy in and funding toward the connectivity initiative and the land extension program. The Massachusetts experience shows that these types of programs are scalable and have a proven record of successful, successful partnerships. Both the connectivity initiative and the land extension program will yield the most broadband expansion in the coming months because they support the most shovel ready um, proposals before you. As the past shows, our members are willing and ready to enter into partnerships with the state and assume the ongoing operation, maintenance, and future upgrades um, that stem from the build out under either construction program. However, we strongly um, suggest that both programs be structured in ways that invite proven providers like our members to participate. As I said previously, there's been much discussion about 100 by 100 symmetry and also fiber to the premises as either preferred or required elements of potential partners. Focusing on either, on solely on either, misconstrues providers' current technological capabilities. No state in the country requires 100 by 100 speed and broadband offerings in these types of partnerships because it is a product, not a capability. It is unnecessary to require such a prescriptive speed symmetry and by framing discussion simply as either 100 by 100 or 25 by three establishes a false policy choice. For instance, today, as I just outlined the Senator McDonald's questions, our members have numerous speed offerings for customers exceeding 25 by three and up to one gigabit of residential service. This reality undermines the need or preference for 100 by 100 or a compliance or a complete fiber to the home solution. Again, evidence of our future proof investments in our products and services lies in that NCTA dashboard that I mentioned at the beginning of my testimony. Vermont, our uh, Vermont customers have easily transitioned to distance learning, telecommuting, and health, telehealth scenarios. Why? Because of our speed offerings and the investments we made in the past. These future-proof networks will be the platform upon which new and fu even future, farther future, fu farther future looking technologies will be unveiled in the near term. Soon you'll be hearing about 10G technology. And, I'll, and I'll, it's important to stress this is not 5G technology, which is a wireless offering, which you're all very familiar with. 10G will be symmetrical, 10 gigabit um, service that will run over our existing networks um, that are the hybrid fiber coaxial cable supported by what's known as DOCSIS 3.1 technology. All of that infrastructure is already in our current physical plant, and there will be very limited need to upgrade that existing technology to be able to provide this, these speeds, symmetrical speeds, to our existing and future customers. In closing, our ongoing commitment to, the, to growth in Vermont is best highlighted by Comcast's an announcement just last week of new construction to 430 homes and businesses. This announcement is beyond any existing franchise agreements that they have, have in place. I suggest to you that that type of, of shovel ready job that is a example of what our members can do if these projects are structured in a way, these programs are structured in a way that will bring us to the table and be a willing partner to expand like we have in the past, like we have in Massachusetts, like we have in New Hampshire, and we're ready to do it, ready to do in the near future in Vermont. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna move along because we are running 
a little late. Um, so if we have any really pressing questions now, other than speed, um, I'm going to go on to John Sutik or Sutich. Well, I'm not sure how it came in Ellis Island, but it came out somewhat, some some version of that. Uh, my dad okay. was Sutich, but his brother pronounced it completely differently. Who knew? Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for your time, uh, Madam Chair, and through you to the members of the committee. Um, I, I, I'm mindful of the time, and I know it's been a, a long day, week, and session for all of you. Um, and so I don't want to be terribly repetitive um, with um, what Tim just went through, and he is an able representative of our industry. Um, but maybe just a quick roadmap, and you can kind of tell me what to maybe focus on or sort of minimize or come back to. Um, <clears throat> but briefly, I, I just want to kind of touch on how our network is performing, some of the work we're doing around uh, specifically for the, for the pandemic response, um, and, and speak to uh, our, briefly to our products and services and, and our network capability and the importance of focusing on network capability when looking for further investment and partnership. And then close with a couple of comments about uh, the, the department's plan. And we'll have much more substantial comments and specific comments on the plan that we'll be submitting. Um, and we're happy to share that with the committee as well. So I, I don't wanna speak too quickly and I'm a, a quick talker by nature. Um, so is that, I guess, prod me along if I'm going too windy on a particular section, but uh, if that sounds okay, I'll get started. Okay, that sounds fine. Thanks. Um, well, first and foremost, I want to I want to thank uh, the administration and all policymakers. Um, the the structures you put around uh, essential and critical services in Vermont has made the ability to keep our employees safe and keep our customers safe and still do the work we need to do very easy. So we're really grateful for that um, really smart and flexible guidance um, with keeping everybody's health in mind. It's been it's been great. Um, so uh, wanted to get that up front. Uh, touching base on our network, um, as Tim referenced, our networks are performing really well. We, you know, they're designed to handle extreme uh, usage, and even with the unbelievable changes we've seen um, and the rapidly changing culture of usage uh, at home and times of when things peak, um, it's working. Um, and that's the result of, of billions of dollars in upgrades, and we're doing thousands of speed tests and diagnostics every day to ensure uh, performance. And uh, our network is designed to be future-proof and, and will always be, or we're committed to that, to that capital investment. And all networks, you know, regardless of the architecture of them, uh, need to be upgraded and maintained to stay future-proof, regardless of how they connect us or with what line. And we, our commitment is that we will always uh, work to upgrade and enhance to exceed the needs of uh, Vermont and, and everywhere we serve. Um, you know, just a note about architecture, you know, Networks are far more than fiber optics or, or what the lines are to make the connections. There's software, there's electronics, and other factors that make these networks go. Uh, for us, we're really committed to products, the, uh, the Wi-Fi, the modems, uh, the X5, the mesh products, the operating system equipment, um, all of which is state-of-the-art to make sure the in-home experience matches uh, the quality of the, the signals coming into the home. Uh, that's really important. And, and our, our technologists are working uh, through our cable labs uh, on this 10G uh, technology uh, to uh, to utilize our existing uh, fiber uh, networks and, and coax networks to provide you know really you know world class speeds. Uh, so there's a lot here and there's more coming. Um, touching on investing in Vermont, um, you know we've been a ready, willing, and capable partner uh, for for several years now since we entered uh, here in 2006. Uh, we've been racketer investment and expansion and growth and innovation. We're an employer of choice and, and proud of the work that all of our colleagues are doing in the, this incredibly difficult period. So um, I think for some reason, there was a little bit of surprise about our announcement uh, last week about additional miles, but you know, the reality is over the last 10 years, we've built about 770 miles of new broadband plant to broadband and other services and almost 70 miles in 2019 alone. Um, and uh, as far as what the, the speed options go, we, we offer broadband options up to one gig. We uh, design our system to focus on download speeds because that's what we see consumers want. Um, we don't sell a symmetric, we, we do sell a symmetrical product of two gig uh, that we're rolling out uh, piece by piece across the country, including uh, some areas of Vermont right now. We offer a lot of commercial broadband options for small businesses to large institutions like hospitals or government. Um, and our network's able to support uh, all of that. Um, 
So, uh, and we've also, you know, the first place Comcast ever participated in a public-private partnership anywhere on broadband build-out was here, and that was kind of the predecessor to the connectivity fund model. Uh, and it's a model we've uh, we've been an evangelist in in other states as a really smart, project-based, achievable uh, model for uh, for government and private business working together on on broadband expansions. And then finally, an issue we we find really important and doesn't get talked about a whole lot uh, is, it, I, although there was a lot of talk about it earlier this year with the principals and the uh, superintendents, and that's broadband adoption. And that's the idea of somebody's on a network but not able to use it for a host of reasons from economic to cultural or, or, or access to a computing device. Uh, we work really hard on that. We've had a program for nine years called Internet Essentials, which uh, is a low cost, uh, low, bro uh, low income broadband program. We've expanded it to seniors and veterans. Um, uh, throughout the years, um, but it's been really key during this time to making sure that people uh, can get connected to a network. Um, let me uh, talk a little bit about our recent announcements and um, the, 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 the issue of our CPG and our requirements around the CPG were raised and I, I, I think it's important to touch on that. Um, so, you know, obviously, as you know, probably all better than I, CPGs are, you know, the documents that negotiate the conditions between service providers and the state. And it creates certainty for the company to operate, creates certainty for the state to know what to expect uh, for performance. Um, you know, for us, CPGs have always been about uh, maintaining the flexibility to invest and grow and run our business in a very dynamic and competitive and technology-minded environment. Um, and we've got a lot of experience doing what we do. We're proven, we're viable. And, uh, you know, for us, you know, we're pretty clear during a CPG negotiation about what we'd like the conditions to be. Uh, it's not always fun, but it always, you know, ends up in a, in a good spot. Um, so for us, the terms really are just set a floor and a set of basic expectations. And especially when it comes to build out requirements, you know, the miles, it's, it's a floor. And we've exceeded every single commitment we've ever made in a, in a document, a CPG document uh, to the state. Uh, because our business as usual is to grow and invest and exceed expectations. So to our recent announcement, that our announcement uh, to seven towns uh, and 430 new address had nothing to do with our CPG requirements. Um, that was uh, an error. Uh, I forget who mentioned it, but that, that's who mentioned it. Uh, those miles will not count toward our CPG requirements. They are business as usual, additional miles. And um, we did get the same letter from Commissioner Tierney about responding to the current Christ, but crisis. Uh, but the reality was that we were already doing a lot of things, making commitments to keep uh, consumers connected to phone and internet services, opening up thousands of hotspots throughout the state, uh, making our low broadband, low income broadband program, uh, uh, internet essentials free for two months. Uh, and we donated $60,000 worth of Chromebooks, Chromebooks to Vermont students uh, who needed a computing device. Uh, so in the case of this announcement, you know, we were mindful of the need to really move projects forward as fast as possible. I mean, we're we're seeing what you're seeing and it's, it's obviously a critical time to do as much as possible um, but it didn't have anything to do with the cpg or, or a reaction to some sort of a bully so um maybe i can uh move on now to the broadband plan and just some of the things that we're seeing in and and we will have more substantial comments down the line um there's two elements in the plan that we really uh, endorse and, and we recognize that vps has just put a ton of time into it and we know it's a, it's a very dynamic time for them to be doing the work that they're doing and so we're mindful of it and uh, we're doing our best to, to stay in touch with them and, and make sure that we're trying to meet um, uh, priorities and expectations um, but the the two plans we endorse is to adopt the federal definition of 25 uh, as a baseline for partnership and that's not to say that that is going to be ideal for every single use in their house but it, it is a common definition throughout the industry it's accepted in all the states, and you know, it, it, and it it makes it 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 makes it it makes the proposal of the plan more inclusive rather than exclusive, and uh, we think that was a smart approach in this emergency plan. And and secondly, and and we're biased because you know it's the product of a lot of work we've done with the state over the years. Is use the connectivity initiative to disperse any potential funds. Um, the connectivity initiative is really a remarkable entity. If you think about it, um, CUDs are comfortable working with the Comcast is comfortable with the connectivity initiative and everybody in between. It's been a great arbiter. Uh, it's a great way to workshop projects and really understand the engineering and technical needs to sort of attack uh, various pieces of that. So um, wanted to make sure that we, we set up front that those are, are two really important pieces. 
Um, so we're already a willing partner on that. We'll continue to do work and, and we're looking at different projects that we may be able to push along like as with the announcement we made as well. But you know, we're, we're very much interested in working with the, with the connectivity initiative as well. Um, so uh, I guess, you know, I've really kind of gone on pretty windy here and I do have some, some more sort of even specific points to the uh, that point, but I, I wanna be responsive to any questions too and not take too much time. So let me okay. stop there and see what folks and talk about. Just to be clear, cause I see Senator McDonald, you're asking, I think, couple things that we don't mandate a hundred a hundred that we go with the 25 three which is right now the national standard I, I i would say it's a it's a floor definition for what yeah is. okay I mean, let me maybe it's, i should probably take a minute on 100 100 I'm, sometimes i'm glad senator mcdonald can't reach through the screen but here we go uh <laughs> The mute button. He's it's, unmuted right now. Oh, that man! I, 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 uh, I'm very confident he can always uh, get his point across, muted or unmuted. So uh, the uh, he writes notes and hands them up to the screen. So look, when we look at 100, 100, that is to us that is a market offering. That is not a statement about network capability. Although you have to have a good network to be able to offer 100, 100, right? Um, you know, it's, uh, it. It, it, it's not a standard in our view. I mean, it, you know, if I look at the history, you know, when fiber to the premises became a, a broadband architecture, uh, you know, once upon a time, the ability to sort of offer symmetrical speeds was a way to differentiate yourself, differentiate, differentiate your service offerings from other providers. But, it, you know, with the evolution of technology that we use and other providers use, you know, the, that sort of gap between fiber to the premises and what we're doing is really basically closed. Um, and so I, I guess I, I think that it is, it is good public policy to push for the, the best for your residents. But I, I guess I caution against using sort of specific market offerings like 100 over 100 or even our market offerings and really focus on network capability. Um, and so in our case, our network is fully capable of offering high grade broadbands. I mean, we're offering 1,000 down, um, which makes, you know, a ton of broadband available in the home. It's just the way we, when we sort of talk to our consumers and understand what they need and, and evaluate uh, the, the, the engineering and architecture, okay. that's what we want. And so it's, it's, we're not trying to be, I, I want to be clear, we're not being dismissed. The goal behind 100-100 in our view is trying to say we want good, high-quality networks providing broadband in our state, but mandating a service level. I think is it gets a little prescriptive in our view. Okay, I've got Senator McDonald and Senator Pearson. So, Madam Chair, I, um, we're not mandating a service level. Um, and if Comcast or any other private company wants to invest their own money in 25-3, um, this, is, this is their prerogative. Um, if you're going to invest the taxpayer's money that has the taxpayers should be able to decide what the limit is that they're willing to put taxpayers money into. Um, the, I'm, I've asked the witnesses to be as specific and to give numbers as possible. And uh, the only numbers, the only number we got in the testimony was um, tons of time. And that's time is not measured in tons. So um, I'm, I know I'm being picky here, but uh -huh. How do we, as the, as the folks who have taxpayer-funded money, set a standard for our network and let the capitalists um, use their own money if they want to do a lower standard? That's the question. Okay. All right. Senator, I'm going to move us along because this is really more committee discussion um, about standards and possibilities. Okay, Senator Pearson, did you have a question? Yeah, and it's similar. And John, I, I hope you can answer. Um, I don't, I can hear what you're saying about mandating 100 100. And I frankly agree with Senator McDonald that when we're talking about public investments, it is important that we uh, build for tomorrow. 
And I'll, I'll just tell you, I live in Burlington. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I have fiber to the home. And I remember a business a friend of mine, a video uh, editor who worked on Church Street, which was served by Comcast, and could not get Burlington Telecom for the longest time. And he would do all of his video work and put it on an iPad and bring it home and upload it to Hollywood in his case in 15 minutes rather than uh, have his computer churning for 12 hours to upload the same kind of file. So the upload, when I think about it, I think about the upload speed and it's the symmetrical technology. That is not to say that everyone needs to pay for that service, but if we're not giving business the opportunity to sign on to something if they need it, that is more robust than then uh, as I understand what coax can provide, then we have uh, not really expanded the business opportunity that comes with robust uh, dual direction broadband. So my question is, uh, is coax capable of symmetrical and, or, or this is where we, we've had this discussion in this committee before, but remind us, um, if you want symmetrical, is there a limit to how fast coax can have upload speeds and, and is, is asking for symmetrical akin to asking for either uh, robust fixed wireless or, or fiber to the home? Well, I mean, look, it's, it's the way our network is engineered. It's to focus on download speeds and provide sufficient upload speeds. But we also have commercial grade products that are probably sometimes more appropriate for those things. But we, you know, our engineers take market feedback and we, you know, serve all sorts of different providers. I can't speak to your friend particularly, and I don't know when exactly this was uh, that you're referring to. Um, but, it, you know, it's in the last two years, we're offering a gig down and I, I look at the upload speeds, it's not a hundred, but it's significant, you know? And, you know, we have people doing substantial work from home, CAD designers, video users, other folks that, you know, are using our gig product and using it happily and well. I mean, it's the, the Delta on the upload speed is, is not that big um, at this point for that product in particular, but our network is certainly capable of it. Um, but the- Is your network capable of it everywhere i mean this is where the technology of well, of if it, clearly it's available where you offer fiber is it well, available well you're, are you asking me, let me, i need to i'm sorry to interrupt sir but i just I'm, I'm trying to understand are you just trying to make me say out loud that our market i mean we're not offering symmetrical broadband we do have a two gig symmetrical program broadband that's um, available within a certain distance from our core fiber network at this point it's not ubiquitous but it's there and it's robust. Um, but across the entire network is, you know, a gig down, which as you know, is 10 times 100. And, um, and not 100 up, but I, I apologize, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but it's, it's like 50 up. And, you know, in our estimation, that is the product that works well for a lot of people. And our network is fully capable. It's handling everything that everybody's throwing at us now. And as Tim referenced, and I got into it too, is that you know, within a year or two or three, we're going to have a substantial upgrade of the operating system and electronics to be able to do 10 gig symmetrical. So I guess my point is that I, I hear you, you know, you don't want to throw tax money at stuff that's not going to work. Except that in our case, you know, when we have taken partnership money and it's not significant, but it's existed, you know, the technology works and it's serving Vermont with high grade state of the art broadband. It's not a symmetrical product, but I don't, but again, symmet symmetrical is a product. And if people need more, you know, well, their services, we've got a range of things we okay. can be doing, but so at the same time, we continue to upgrade the technology. I, I'll, finish, I'll finish quickly, Madam Chair, and I'm not trying to be picky. I'm trying to, you please understand there, I'm, I'm sharing my ignorance. So um, you okay. said that you you can offer a gigabyte down and call it, 50 megs up, correct? Is that what you just said? That's your standard? Well, that's what, that's our, that is our gig offer. We have a range of offers from 25.3. Okay. Is every Comcast customer in Vermont able to get that service or that's? Yes. Every, every customer in Vermont is able to get a gig, you know, the gig, our, what we call our gig residential product. 
Okay. So coaxial can give that kind of upload speed. Yeah, and it has for nearly two years. Okay, thank you. Okay. And one of the questions we may be faced with is we're going to have a finite amount of money. Sure. And how do we choose to spend it? We Do we spend it to get the best possible service, which may be a lot more service than some people need or want or can afford. Um, we've, we've been talking about kids who have no connectivity, who can't do their schoolwork. And if we're gonna use COVID money, it's gonna have to get tied somehow to that. So, um, that's just, this is going to be an ongoing discussion, but not all public money is the same. I don't think we're coming up with $86 million worth of state money. Um, if we do small connectivity projects, we may be able to require that. We may make it a norm, but the federal money is going to come with attachments always does and i think we can have th this argument when we have money to spend right now as far as i know we don't have very much that's, that's uh, true I, you know I, as we as we've seen in other states and and what's difficult about the connectivity initiative is is you know the financing of it right it's um you know when i look at massachusetts the success there has been related to bond money they, they've bonded liquidity uh, for right. purposes of putting that kind of gas in the tank and making it go. And it's, um, and it's leveraged a lot of private investment. It's leveraged a lot of unique partners um, beyond the cable companies um, okay. to kind of solve these solutions. So I guess I, guess I want to close by saying, you know, the, the connectivity initiative, when you get, when you have what you have, or get it, it's going to have to do things in sort of kind of micro bursts anyway, because when you get to last mile projects, the successful ones are sort of chunked off, thought through, and kind of addressed. Vermont's got obviously a very dynamic topography, um, and, there's, and, and just sometimes the way these last mile projects have to work is you have to kind of define them relatively small. It's a lot of work, and a lot of credit goes to the, the connectivity folks and the, the, the companies working together to, to workshop these solutions. Um, okay. So, so a great place to get it done. If I heard two asks from you, one was the don't mandate 100, 100 everywhere. Yep. And the second was, and I'm not sure if we got money. So if we got the $86 million, yep. you would like that to go through the connectivity fund process rather than through the, the reverse, reverse auction, auction process? process? You know, it, well, I haven't, I, to be fair, we haven't really dived too deeply into the reverse auction process. We're, we're just recognizing the success uh, and structure okay. of, of the okay. connectivity initiative. It's worked. And I think it, it bears, you know, noting every okay. provider, regardless of your structure and background, has gone and worked with the connectivity initiative. So okay. I think it's just an endorsement of the structure. All right. Okay. Jeff Austin. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Cummings and the members of the committee. Uh, for the record, Jeff Austin from Consolidated Communications. It's nice to see you all again. So I was kind of looking at my notes and trying to figure out where to go. I, I agree with a lot of what John just said. You know, definitely props to the Connectivity Initiative and the Department of Public Service. Um, you know, we definitely have some, um, some areas where we, we agree at a lot of things and there's a lot of parallels. Um, certainly agree with a lot of what um, what Roger said. So I'm just going to go through a couple of things here, talk about some of the, I know we've visited probably some of this previously, but I'll go real quick. So ultimately, the emergency broadband action plan in general, certainly consolidated supports it. It, it relies on $300 million or so, depending on how the money's going to come in. So if there's money, then, then that's great. Um, and certainly consolidated uh, would want to be part of that. So we're going to file more comments on that on by May 26, which is a deadline, but um, certainly in general, it's a pretty good roadmap um, to start with uh, to get those 70,000 locations in Vermont that don't qualify for 25-3. Um, 
something that Roger said that I think is worth kind of um, going a little bit more into detail, brought, um, the ILEX and consolidated, as a designated carrier of last resort in our territory, uh, we take seriously and with great responsibility and expense the obligation of being the carrier of last resort. And with these fiber of the prime conversations and 100 meg symmetrical and, and the emergency broadband plan, it's absolutely our intention to be part of the solution, you know, for these future builds. You know, I used the word previously and um, in the previous sentence because we don't just want to be um, and can't just be the carrier of last resort. Uh, we want to be both and believe consolidated part, uh, participation in both creates the best possibilities for balance uh, for Vermont. And we'll work hard to continue those conversations. I believe, uh, Madam Chair, you and the committee know that we've been working with the Department of Public Service, electric companies, CUDs, towns. There's a lot of conversations going on here in Vermont. Um, so we're involved in those conversations. Um, you know, something that we, we might have talked about um, as it relates to expansion of network. We have, a, we have a large network in Vermont. We have, I believe we have the largest network in Vermont, the most fiber with infrastructure to virtually every location in our 7,400 square mile footprint in Vermont. We cover a very large uh, portion of Vermont. There's about 9,600 square miles in Vermont total. So we have a really good, uh, a pretty good amount of that. 3,700 miles of existing fiber, one of the things I just want to kind of point out is we have over a thousand fiber fed remote terminals today. Um, many of these go deep into rural areas. So the management, financial, technical expertise, we believe we're we bring a lot to the table and encourage anyone looking to expand broadband to engage us in these discussions. We're reaching out to folks, again, I listed, you know, the group, the CUDs, the electric companies to have these conversations. Because if we're looking at line extensions, um, you know, and potentially line extensions for um, maybe fiber to the prem, you know, and, it, and if there is money in that $300 million and consolidated is looking to participate, we would be looking for a fiber to the prem solution um, as it relates to how we would spend those dollars. Definitely shovel ready projects. Um, so like I mentioned, we're the closest carriers are all of these locations today. Uh, we have a large redundant, you know, uh, John talked about networks. Now we have a huge network in Vermont. Um, and that's extremely important. Roger talked about networks, billing. Money that comes in can be put into practice, can be put into play, uh, and doesn't need to be put into developing whatever kind of business model. So, so there, like I said, there's definitely some synergies there. And uh, we're certainly looking forward to, we've had public-private partnerships. We're looking forward to RDOF uh, and working on our strategy for RDOF and the department's broadband plan. So there's a lot of stuff going on. And certainly consolidated is looking into all of that. Uh, we built fiber of the prime. You know, this is not a new thing for consolidated. Um, new York had a broadband project. They had about $500 million they spent. We built about 17,000 locations with fiber in, in, in New York, building fiber in Chesterfield, New Hampshire. That's done. Five other towns were working on that. CAF builds. Um, one, just so you know, and I think you guys know, this is a continuation, right? We're always building in Vermont. Um, on Monday, we're going to open a, a location in Barnett that was part of a Vermont connectivity grant um, and a partnership with the town. The town's giving us some money, the state's giving us some money, really good collaboration. So that's actually, that was due on 7 1. We've worked really hard to expedite it because of obviously the coronavirus. So we're going to be opening that site up on Monday. I've already let the folks know it's Barnett. So we're going to be looking for orders. And this is going to be getting folks internet that have never had access to wireline internet previously. So that's that's a great story. Okay. We've actually opened up um, eight projects in the last two months for new locations around the state. So everywhere in the state, um, we obviously have activity going on. Um, okay. Before Senator McDonald asks, what's the speed? Oh, well, what we're deploying today um, as it relates to the grant and the grant requirements, mm -hmm. um, we're building out VDSL, very high bitrate DSL. The highest speed that people can qualify um, is up to 100 meg on the download, 40 meg on the upload, but it's distance sensitive. So our requirement as part of the grant is to make sure that everybody in the grant locations qualifies for 10 down, one up. So that's the qualification when we got the grant. I know that- 10 more. Yep, 10 okay. more. Now, those numbers have changed um, because now it's 25.3, 25.3, 25.4, 25.5, 25.6, 25.7, 25.8, 25.9, 25.10, 25.11, 25.12, 25.13, 25.14, 25.15, 25.16, 25.17, 25
you know, based on the information about Act 79. But if we go to the emergency broadband plan and there's federal money or federal money available, $300 million or whatever the number is, um, our strategy to get to the 25.3 would be fiber to the prem and it would be 100 meg symmetrical, you know, in that area. Just can, so can, I'm sorry, Madam Chair, can he just repeat that last um, Can that you last repeat? Sentence? Sure. Yep. If, so if there's money in the emergency broadband plan, so if we do get, let's say, the $300 million that we had talked, uh, that's kind of in the plan um, with one of the uh, with one of the funding, then consolidated, if we're going to be participating, that would be a fiber to the front solution for us. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. Okay. And, thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, can I just say two quick other things? Yep. These are really quick. It's going to, it's 70,000 locations. It's a four year build. It's a lot of work. Uh, Roger mentioned this. It's going to take a lot of resources. Um, it's going to, you know, we live in Vermont, right? So there's the build season is not that long. So that I think should be a tight schedule. That's a really tight mm -hmm. schedule, but we've got, you know, shovel ready projects. Um, and affordability, John mentioned that they have a program related to affordability. I think that's important. We have a, and they have a lot of tiers of service so people can choose what they want. We have a lot of tiers from service starting at $19.99 a month. So if we're if there's building out of broadband and it's fiber and the lowest tier is going to be $65 a month, I think that's just going to create more conversations um, because the affordability is going to be a real problem for a lot of Vermonters. So one of the balances. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Agreed. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank, thank you for the you. time, I appreciate it. Okay, uh, Senator Brock, you have a question? Just, just a very quick question uh, to, uh, to Jeff, and it goes to what we're going to talk about later and talk about briefly. Uh, if you, when you go fiber to the premises with consolidated, you have, I assume, a network interface on the exterior of the premises? Actually, uh, Senator, if you guys can see this, uh, this That's is an- it. This is an interior optical network termination device. And this is what we usually use. We, we do put fiber to the prem in Vermont. We have several locations where we have fiber. We actually prefer these. Um, and this is actually an interior optical network termination device that, okay. needs, that needs to have commercial power uh, to work. Yep. If that uh, power to that device fails, do you know about it? And can you monitor it? I believe we can monitor it. I don't believe at this point that we have this big, large monitoring system together to see if they're working or not. Um, but we know when things go down. On, but what I really tried to, to find out is, as we've heard from VTEL, when their mm -hmm. network interface device goes down, although they don't necessarily look at it on an item by item basis, they do have the ability to recognize that a group of those devices are not working. And as a result, there's no power to them through, through your system. And then at that point, if that's the case, who's responsible for repairing it? Well, it depends. Um, if we saw a lot of these down at the same location, that could be a problem. That could be a fiber cut, you know? So we'd obviously have to go and research just like we do today, actually, with a remote terminal. If a remote terminal goes down, we have to go find out why that remote terminal went down. Is it commercial power or was there a fiber cut? Our accident that took a pole out could be a, a, a few different things. Well, under so, our reporting standard, uh, what we've said is a report, what's reportable is 25 devices or more down for half an hour. Would you be able to monitor and report that to the 911 board? Yeah, I believe we could. Yeah. Okay. I That's do all. Have, I, Thank you very much. And Senator DeBrock, just on that point, I know there are some questions related to the uh, the E911 reporting, the outage reporting rule that you yes. referenced. Um, one of the things that's interesting is with a federal, with a larger, well, the national carriers, there was some discussion about the, F, the FCC reporting. If they have current FCC reporting requirements, then that the state requirement would just default to the FCC requirements. Currently, I, I just, I guess maybe a clarification if you have it, currently consolidated has FCC requirements, but we also report today on the state requirements of 25 right. customers for 30 or more. So just for parity purposes, it, is there the ability for now consolidated to report or just on our FCC standards and not the 25 yes. customers? Okay. Well, what we've asked 
is that in the event, uh, at least with this amendment in 301, in the event that you have the capability of doing that, we ask you to voluntarily do that. We don't make it mandatory if okay. you also have FCC reporting. That's fair. Thank you, sir. Okay.